Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. My name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. Our objective is to enthuse, inspire, energize, and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes here in BW and beyond. We do so by inviting these entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs into our makeshift studio. Sometimes we call them to the restaurant, sometimes we go uh, to our studio and we ask them to share their experiential knowledge, their experiences and their expertise. And we ask them uh, as many questions as we can aimed at empowering you also as a viewer. Hello dear viewer, dear listener, my name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. I welcome you to another episode of Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. It's always a pleasure to have you on this uh, lovely program of ours. Hopefully uh, we empower you, uh, we enthuse you, we also uh, inspire you as, as per our tagline. Uh, this time around I have a great guest who's going to talk about early childhood education. A very, very interesting entrepreneur indeed. Um, Welcome to the show. Thank you, Ramukobe. Okay. If you were to introduce yourself, what would you say? What Tell us about the key bits about your background. Mm. Mm. I would start by saying that I am love. I love life. Mm -hmm. I love people. I am purpose. I believe in purpose. Mm. I believe that we all came into existence for a reason. My name is Debojo Ubuseng. Mm -hmm. I hail from the lovely town of Silibi Pique. I work as an educational specialist. Mm -hmm. I have a company called Bala After School. We help preschools optimize their services. Okay, what is your profession? I'm an early childhood teacher. Mm -hmm. I've been teaching for 15 years now. Mm -hmm. And the, the training that went with that? Yes, so I'm an ex I was an experienced teacher before I was a qualified teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I have a certificate in early childhood education. But before that, I taught for probably 13 years. So I had the experience before I actually sat down and got the qualification. What is early childhood? From what ages to what ages? Generally from birth until eight years old. Mm -hmm. Of course, kids don't go to school, you know, when they are born, but they are learning. So formally from preschool, from three years old until eight years old. Okay. So in terms of your, your, your organization, so what its key objectives? What are the main things that you do? Okay. So the services that we offer, we go into a preschool, whether it's a startup preschool, or an existing preschool, mm -hmm. and we help them identify their vision and mission and help them find ways for the school and the school community to embody that vision and mission. I mean, without a vision, without a mission, an organization is just flailing. There's, mm. It doesn't have a reason to operate. Mm. So I believe that's the first thing. And then practical things for everyday running, we help with teacher training including classroom management, play-based learning, which I'm a big advocate of. What is play-based learning? Well, learning through play mm -hmm. is how kids learn. If you observe children before they go to school, they learn naturally from playing. I think even adults. Mm -hmm. We have more fun when we enjoy what we're doing and when we're playing. Okay. I know that you've traveled extensively, you've lived in Japan and so on. Tell us about that experience and how it shaped what you're doing now. Okay. <laughs> well, I was very curious from a very young age. I always wondered why. Why are we here? Why do we do the things that we do? And I think it's curiosity that, you know, took me through my journey. Like I said, I believe everyone has a purpose. And I think we know our purpose if we listen to ourselves. That inner guidance, we all have that inner guidance. Mm -hmm. I have, like I said, an interesting journey of how I ended up right here. I want to take you through it. Mm -hmm. So it was all listening to this voice that I had. 
Um, when I was in primary school in Pique, my parents wanted to take me to boarding school, like, you know, a lot of kids in Botswana. I had interviewed at the international school in Mabato. I was excited about it. That's where I was going. Mm -hmm. Then a girl at school came in, and she had gone for an interview at a school in Johannesburg. And she was going on and on about it, calling it an American school. Mm. Just from her description, I went back home, and I told my dad, for Papa, mm. we have to go to this school for an interview. My dad took me to that school, and that's the school I decided to go to. Something really simple. The reason I chose that school was because they didn't wear uniform. Mm -hmm. And that school for me, you know, at that age and where... it wasn't American. It wasn't an American <laughs> school. It wasn't an American school. I guess not wearing uniform resembled mm. American schools. Mm. Um, that school for me, at the young age of 12, Form 1, mm. where you are coming into yourself, it was a perfect fit for me. One of the reasons why they didn't wear uniform at that school was because we were all individuals and they wanted us to have a strong identity. It had a really good art program. I majored in art and speech and drama, which was wonderful. I, I don't think it has to mention the school, does it? The name of the school was Woodmead School. Mm. It closed down actually yeah. in 1998, yeah. unfortunately. and. Uh, even, you know, the school that I went to next was also me following my guidance. Mm -hmm. So I was very relaxed about school. The school was shutting down. I didn't even think about where I would go to school. I didn't believe the school would shut down. So anyway, another company bought the school. And I told my dad, you know, another company bought the school. I can go back to that school. I went back to that school. Mm -hmm. It was nothing like Woodmead. Mm -hmm. First of all, it was overcrowded. I was there just a few days, and I decided I cannot be in the school. There was kind of a sister school that we knew about in the area mm. called Putin College. Mm -hmm. I remember I went to the public phone. Mm. I didn't have a cell phone. I think I was 15 in 1999, mm. 15 or 16. Maybe cell phones were just getting, yes. getting into so the I market then. Yes, yes, certainly in Botswana, they were new. I didn't have a cell phone. I went to the public phone. I must have looked up the number for Putin College in the directory. Mm. I called the school. I set up an interview. For yourself? For myself. Mm. I called a maxi cab. There were, you know, the meter cabs at the time mm. to pick me up. We went to the school. I explained to the school manager that my parents were in Botswana <laughs> and that I needed a school. Mm. Um, they let me sit for the interview. I waited for the results. The principal, Mr. Drake, um, came out to meet me, and I think he was just shocked. Mm, at your initiative. Who, that who is this? Who is this young girl who is here by herself? You know, the results came out. I did really well. Mm. Um, he called my dad, mm. and I said, "Okay, call my dad and tell him that you guys will accept me and I can start." Mm. Called my dad. They communicated. The next day, I called the cab back, I brought all my stuff, and I started at wow. Putin. Uh, and you never looked back since? No. All right. Let's talk about the importance of early childhood, of education. Mm. That is your passion, something that you really thought about it. Mm. Can you analyze and uh, critique that for us? And, and, and you know, um, what is it? Analyze, you know, put mm. it before us so we understand it, the importance of early, early childhood education. So those early years, from, like I said, birth to mm. eight years old, mm. those are the formative years. Mm -hmm. That's when intellectual, social, emotional, and language development happens. Mm -hmm. And that's when habits are formed. That's a particularly important age for parents to be aware of. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about early childhood education, of course there's the formal education at the school, but I like to talk to parents also about, you know, what they teach their children. Parents are children's biggest role models and children's biggest teachers. Mm. So when you're a parent, I think it's very important to be aware of that. Mm. What habits are you teaching your child? Children learn from imitation. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, purpose, you've, mm. uh, 
you, you're very big on purpose because mm. I think you've mentioned even when we started. What is your purpose and why do you think it's central mm. to early childhood education? Mm. I'm a teacher and my purpose is to teach through sharing information. Mm -hmm. Purpose is central to early childhood education because we all want meaning. We want to do something that has meaning. Children need to be taught that they can do something that they enjoy and that they have an inner guide and natural inclination mm -hmm. to something. And that's the thing that they should be doing because it comes natural to them. Mm. Okay, so, so at what stage you know, in the development of the child should a parent sit down with the child and say, let's identify your purpose? It doesn't happen like that. Mm. I mean, I think to be curious is how you find your purpose. I went all around the world mm. searching and uh, it found me on a not a special day. I was very curious. I think the more curious you are, the more you follow what interests you. Mm -hmm. The more you follow what interests you is how you'll find your purpose. Mm -hmm. Do you believe in purpose? I do. I think without it, uh, you can't go very far. I mean, your vision, your purpose, your mission, all those things I believe in. Um, Parents as teachers. Mm. Um, I have uh, children, so do you. Um, but we never quite see ourselves as teachers. Mm. We see ourselves, yes, perhaps as influencers. Mm. But you believe strongly that we are actually teachers. Mm. Parents definitely are teachers. Actually, I don't have children. Oh, okay. Yes, I don't have children. But I think all the time about, you know, when I have children, this is what I will teach them. Mm. So when I talk about habits, we learn habits from home. Mm -hmm. Money habits, eating habits, the way we think. So definitely parents are teachers. Mm -hmm. So when I say parents are teachers, the way I look at it, when you have children, I think you can actually create a blueprint you decide what you want to teach your children. For instance, you want to teach them good money management. I want to teach my kids good money management. And you think of the practical ways that you can teach kids good money management. I actually read um, on a blog recently, I think it was a blog by Mark Manson, mm. and he was talking about how his father taught him good money management. So he says that his dad used to pay them for chores around the house, and he'd give them an option that either they can take part of the money and then he keeps part of the money and the money earns interest. And when they wanted something, for instance, he says he wanted a Lego set. His dad said, fine, you don't have enough money in your savings, but I can borrow you money, but it's going to incur interest. Mm. So he took the money from his dad and that money incurred interest and he had to work so many chores, he chores for so long, mm and not receiving any money because it was going to pay for his Lego set. Mm. So that's and an example. The interest had, had compounded. Exactly. So at a young age, he learned about borrowing money, mm -hmm. saving money, and about interest. I mean, those are practical ways that you can teach children about money. Mm -hmm. I have the system where I get them to read and then I... I call it an ethical bribe, mm. where I ask them to read a book or a mm -hmm. chapter, you know, and then I give them something. Is that a proper way of doing it or I'm, I'm doing it wrong? How has it been working for you? That's how you know whether it's the proper way It's worked fantastic exactly. for, for one particular child. The other mm. one is still work in progress. Why? Does the other child not enjoy the reading? The other one uh, will give a thousand excuses, but I've noticed in the last two terms she's she's doing splendidly well all of a sudden mm. so most like after covid the child woke up and the child is getting top marks mm. but the the middle one who is now uh, in mauritius mm. um is delivering results and she, he tells me i don't ask him he tells me this is a direct result of this business of 
for me. Uh, initially, I was forcing him to read, to be honest. Mm. Mm. It works. I mean, the only way you can judge whether it's working is if it produces results. Mm. And all children are not the same. It worked immediately for one child, and maybe it took longer for the other one. And mm. you can go back and tweak a little bit. But one thing also, okay, I have a question for you. Mm. When you saw that it wasn't working for the other child, did you continue to enforce it? Did you give her money even though she wasn't keeping her end of the deal? Well, I did give her a little bit because she did well at school. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we're, we're now arranging her sweet 16 birthday. Okay. Yeah. So she got something. All right. For doing well at school. I know parents find it hard to stick to their end when, you know, when you make a deal with your child that if you do this, I'll give you this. Mm. I think parents give in. Mm. Even though the child doesn't produce, they give in. And I think children are waiting for that. They're testing. Mm. Okay. So, um, personal experience with inner guidance. Mm. You mentioned uh, your faith, but you also mentioned, did you mention Japan? Yes. Yeah, you, you didn't really tell us about your experience there, but maybe there's a chance to tie it all in. Okay, so mm. I want to go back to inner guidance again. Mm. Mm, when I went to university, I studied audiovisual production management in Johannesburg, at mm -hmm. the University of Johannesburg. At the time, it was called Rao. Mm -hmm. After that, Rao. I... Rao. Rao. Rand Afrikaans University. Uh -huh, yes, yes. Mm. at the time. Uh, after that, I went on a six-month work travel program to the States, which was also something I, I had always wanted to do since I was a child. Mm. I came back, I worked in Johannesburg. Obviously you were influenced by hip hop and, and yes, movies. <laughs> very much, <laughs> yeah. very, very much. And that trip changed my life. Mm -hmm. I, for the first time, I got to see myself outside of myself, outside of home. Mm. I think that's when I became very strongly, proudly African. I came back, went back to Johannesburg. I worked in the TV industry for two, between two and three years. And one day, a girl by the name of Lebohang walked in. We became friends immediately, very close. And she had applied for a program in Japan to teach English. So the Japanese government, through its embassies, recruits English teachers for their public schools through their embassies all over the world. At the time, Botswana didn't have a Japanese embassy. Mm. So she had applied, and she worked only six months, and she went to Japan. So I was in Johannesburg. I loved my job. I worked. I was a production manager at the time for a TV production company. Mm. But I was itching to travel, to leave and go somewhere different. I was actually on my way to an agency that recruited teachers to work in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And I emailed Lebohang and I told her, I've got an appointment with this agency to go teach English in Brazil. And she said, ah, Tebza, there's so many English teaching jobs here. Mm. Why don't you come here? Mm. And this is how I ended up moving to Japan. Mm. I sold my car, I quit my job, I went to Japan on a tourist visa mm -hmm. <laughs> that was valid for three months. Mm. And the rest is history. I lived there for 10 years. I was an English teacher. So for the you, first- So do you speak fluent Japanese? Not fluent. Mm. I spoke conversational Japanese. Mm. I call it shopping Japanese, enough mm -hmm. to go around and shop. Mm. I lived and taught English. But you didn't English. need to know Japanese to make a living. You didn't need to. I didn't. We actually were not allowed to use Japanese in the classroom. I lived in the second biggest city in Japan, Osaka, which was more international than, you know, other smaller towns. Mm -hmm. I taught English for five years, still asking myself, what is my purpose? What is my purpose? Mm. I was very interested in Africa's development. And at the time, I was doing an online course studying food security. And I was sitting there wondering, why am I teaching kids? And you know, I always question, how can I help? How can I contribute to Africa's development and so forth? Mm. And it just hit me one day that actually, it's better to groom. That's where the inner guidance came in. Yes, it's better to groom the young than to change 
the adults. Mm -hmm. And that's when I thought, okay, Does that this come from is the why old saying, I'm teaching. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Yes. <laughs> Honestly, it hit me on a random day at my desk studying for a completely unrelated course. And is that when you decided to focus on early childhood education? Mm, not even then did I decide to focus. I think I understood why I was so good at teaching, why mm. it came naturally to me. When I came back to Botswana is when I decided to focus on it. Mm. Practical ways to teach uh, one's children. Mm -hmm. I think we've been talking about it and we recognize that the parents are the children's uh, most important teachers. Yes. But now you want to practicalize it for us. Yes. Um, it was the example that we spoke about, about, mm. you know, if you want to teach your kids mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. money management and practical ways. Think, yeah. okay, how can I get them to understand money? Mm -hmm. Those are when should we start teaching children about money and entrepreneurship? Is it at kindergarten? Is it at primary school? Or is it at junior secondary or senior? When should we start? I think the earlier the better. When kids start having a concept of money, mm. I mean, that comes when they're young, when they know that they want to buy something at the shops, when you go to the shops with them and, uh, you know, they ask for something. Mm. That's when they have that, you can start teaching them then about the value of money and then you actually work to make money. So when they start to have that and I concept. still don't understand why it's a taboo or mm. in an African setting to talk about money. And if so, how we overcome this I know it is taboo, quote unquote, but I, I think you have some ideas as to how we can. Is it a taboo? It, it's, it's been a little bit of a taboo in the sense that it's hardly ever discussed. Mm. And certainly uh, in African cultures where, for instance, in my second, in my case, I'm a first generation entrepreneur full time. Mm. Um, money wasn't discussed that much around the dinner table or even generally. Hey, my parents preached money all mm -hmm. the time. My dad reminded us how expensive school was, how hard he was working. No, I mean beyond just complaining to say money doesn't grow on trees, mm. you're wasting money, beyond just dismissing. I, I, I'm talking about really getting deep mm. to understand value, to teach mm. them entrepreneurship, mm. to even introduce it into, into the curriculum. Yes. Mm. Um, it shouldn't be a taboo. Mm. It shouldn't be a taboo. It's something that all adults spend most of their time thinking about. Honestly, I think it's just maybe absent parenting. That is a problem. Yeah. That is what, is, uh, that is what creating mm. the... Yeah. But what, what ideas do you have for us to overcome that? Like I said, when you have children, I think parents should sit down and actually discuss and write down what they want to teach their children, values they want to teach their children, practical skills they want their children to learn. And those don't come from school. They don't all come from school. Mm. I want to shift to your uh, business a little bit. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of uh, preschools have been affected by COVID. In fact, I'm not even sure whether they've now been opened for, for, for early, early childhood, uh, like two-year-olds. Has the government relaxed some of those? And the government did relax um, mm. so they, those this, regulations. But it appears as if parents are afraid to send their children. We, for instance, have a preschool in Kanye, I may have mentioned this to you, which had to close down because mm. the parents uh, were too afraid that children might catch COVID. COVID. And actually, I think children are safest from COVID. Mm. Um, I think... Because mm. my question is, um, what is your organization doing to address the situation? And what advice are you giving to, uh, to, to preschools that have been affected by COVID? Honestly, to follow government protocols, mm. sanitize, temperature, the masks, because mm. we still have to, you know, be wary of the virus. Mm -hmm. It's still circulating. And find ways to still f have children enjoy the classes. Be outdoors, mm. I would say. Mm. And to what extent has COVID affected your profession as, an, as a consultant in that area? 
actually my consultancy started because of COVID. Oh, so it's a dividend, it's a benefit for you. <laughs> it's a benefit because we ran other different programs that COVID completely shut down. Mm -hmm. We had a holiday school program, mm -hmm. which stopped because not only were parents afraid of sending their kids to school, they didn't want to take that risk over the holidays. Mm -hmm. We had tutoring groups, those stopped because of the same worry. Mm. I mean, a lot of schools don't have afternoon activities. It was something that we did with the kids after school. And so a lot of our services actually stopped. We did adapt though to Zoom lessons mm. for the tutoring. Mm -hmm. So that's something that- Is it still ongoing, that one? Still ongoing, but we are transitioning mm -hmm. to focus mostly on the consultation for other schools. So that's your niche market. Yes. So give us an idea of how you help schools on a practical level. For instance, uh, I use myself as a guinea pig. My school mm. had to close down. How can you help? First of all, I think any organization needs a vision, a mission, because that's what drives mm. the organization. So we start by identifying the vision for your school. The mission is, you know, the steps that we're going to take daily to get there. Mm. All everyone who's involved in the school, the students, the parents, and the staff need to know that vision and mission because it's what guides the work every day. Mm. Teacher training. Teacher training, things like classroom management, how the teacher manages the classroom, play-based learning, which I spoke about, how to teach the kids and have fun at the same time. I always say, if you're having fun as a teacher, trust me, the kids are having fun. And at that age in preschool, you can't sit at desks and kids, preschool kids don't learn like that. Mm. When children play, that's how they learn. Mm. They're not even thinking that they're learning. They are just learning. It's like the kids who live in the villages who don't go to preschool. But by the time they get to primary school, they can speak, mm -hmm. they can count, and they have developed in the same ways the kids who've gone to preschool have developed. So do you walk into a school and then take down notes and then issue reports and recommendations, or do you actually engage in terms of getting your hands dirty and turning the schools around? I definitely do. I do both. We go to the school, of course, sit with the management, we go around, we observe lessons, mm. we speak to the teachers, speak to the principal, the management, and when we do the training, of course, you know, the only way you teach is through demonstration. Mm -hmm. I get my hands dirty, teachers observe me, mm. so they can see exactly what it is that, you that know, you expect. yes, that I expect. Okay, in this program you're allowed to brag a little bit. Uh, what would you say is your success rate? Maybe even without mentioning names, you can give us examples of schools you've assisted and turned around or whatever. So, like I said, the consultation just started because of COVID. Mm. Um, no schools to brag about yet, but in the business that we had before, the model that we had before with the holiday school, with um, the tutoring, we have hundreds of students. Mm. We have hundreds of students. Everywhere I go, I meet students, I meet parents, I check on my students, I check on my par the parents, even though I'm not teaching, I still think about them. Mm. I still mm. think about them and wonder how they're doing. Okay. I have students who, on the Zoom lessons I've had since they were in reception, I have students who I started with in primary school, they're now in high school. I still talk to them, I still find out how they're doing, and I still help out where I can. Mm. And how, have you replicated yourself in terms of training more teachers to be like you? We're as, as in that process. Mm. I did a bit during holiday school, not as much as I would have liked, but with the consultancy, that's part of our vision. Mm. Wonderful. Um, you say education reform is important. Mm. Define the term and tell us how we go about effecting it. Education reform, in my opinion, is education changing to mirror the times and 
the environment. In my opinion, the strongest point I would like to drive for education reform is teacher salaries, teacher benefits. If I were to look at government schools, how do we make government schools better? Not just in Botswana, any country. Mm. To attract good quality teachers, they need to be paid well so that they commit and they do their best. The benefits that they have is very, very important. And in countries where teachers get paid well, it's, you know, their performance is good. Research has been done to show that um, teacher, high teacher salaries equal high teacher performance. So that's, for me, the first step to education reform. And like I said, mirror, education needs to mirror the environment. Look at what we're dealing with now. Mm. Globalization. Is, is this message getting through to the bureaucrats and to the politicians? I hope so. Any signs? I hope so. We have to scream louder. Mm. I hope so. I mean, look at global warming. Mm. This is things that children, our kids are going to be dealing with. But what are we, what is the education system, what skills are they giving them for them to deal with those issues? I often wonder whether the people who make the curriculum ever take the time to go out there in the marketplace and to meet with people like you, to take notes and to see what reforms are needed. Does mm. that ever happen? I wonder. I'm sure they're doing, you know, as great a job as they can. But? No buts. Mm. No buts. I'm sure they're trying the best that they can. I just know that I have an image of what I would do differently. Mm. Okay, maybe you could use that then to spring to the next point, which mm. is about culture, the role of culture in mm. education. What are your thoughts on that? I think culture needs to be part of our education. I think the government schools or other schools, even private schools, do a good, do try to do that. For instance, I've seen traditional dance mm -hmm. happening in schools. Mm. You know, the schools have gardens, which is um, teaching agriculture, which is wonderful. We could do more mm. festivals. You know, the festivals that we have in our culture, we could do those in schools, involve the community. I think community life can revolve around schools. Mm. Okay, now somebody will ask themselves maybe a bit challenged, some entrepreneur. Mm. How monetizable is this as a career? By that I'm referring to early childhood education. Is there money to be made? It's a need. So therefore there is money to be made. All parents send their kids to school. They want a good education. There's definitely money to be made. In which area? The consultancy area or in actually starting up schools or? In both, mm. in starting up schools, in consulting for schools, in both. So what would you say to those uh, people who might be scratching their heads, wondering whether there's something they can jump into? Give it a try. Mm. If you love kids, if you like teaching, you like to work with kids, it's definitely something worth trying. Mm -hmm. It's lovely. I'll never work in an office. Mm. with adults. Yeah. Working with children is... It's a joy. It's a joy. You walk in, you forget everything. You forget your problems, you are not overthinking. And kids are lovely. They love everyone. They're pure. Mm. And in terms of Botswana um, um, adopting best practices, is there a country um, out there or a community who you think have it right, people we can benchmark from? Or, or emulate? Well, I would say countries like Sweden and Finland have um, a reputation for their school system. They move with the times, they change. What is it they do that we don't? Play-based learning mm -hmm. is very important. Like I said, children learn through play and Watching what the kids are interested in, child-centered learning, where you, as a teacher, you watch the kids when they play, and you can see what they are drawn to, 
you make a note of it and you plan your lessons around that. Do you think that um, religion or faith-based learning should be injected or introduced at that early stage or not? I think that happens at home. Mm -hmm. I think that happens at home. I mean, at schools, you find people from, you know, I mean, students from different religious backgrounds, spiritual backgrounds. So you believe keeping uh, religion out of schools? Mm, yeah. Or is that a tough subject for you? It's too political. It's not political. It's too religious. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's too religious. I would, if I opened a school, I would teach values. Mm -hmm. Yes. How we collaborate. And I would teach our culture, hmm. not necessarily religion. I, wa I want to just uh, talk to you about our culture and education. You already mentioned the importance of introducing Boto. Um, you feel that we're not doing enough at the moment to introduce culture at the early level? And if so, how do you think, what more can we do? For me, even small things as far as culture is concerned. Mm. The games that we play as children after school, the ghetto. Mm -hmm. The ghetto, first of all, when you do this, mm. It teaches hand and eye coordination, yes. which is one of the steps in development for young kids in preschool. Mm -hmm. It teaches that. It teaches counting. Mm, yes. <laughs> so if instead of sitting in the classroom with toys that we buy at shops, kids go outside, they learn that. Mm. I actually, one of our holidays... And in some ways, they're much more fun. Yes, exactly. Koi, Morabaraba, problem solving. Mm. Morabaraba is about problem solving yes, skills. Yes, it's yeah. definitely problem solving. Mm. Um, Joseta. Remind me, oh yeah, yeah, you mean Hutuha, that's yeah. my guess. Uh -huh. Yes, hey. yes. I, know. I mean, it's active mm -hmm. and kids learn about food, Processing food, Perhaps where you the food comes from. in English from. what Hutuha and Joseta mean. Yes. So, a pounding of a sorghum, mm. whole sorghum meal. Mm. So I used to do that a lot as a child. Really? Mm. Yes, it keeps you active mm -hmm. and it's fun. Mm. You take turns and, like I said, you learn about where your food comes from, how it comes about. Mm. What, 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 what happened? Because it's like, this thing suddenly disappeared in the last 20 years or 30 years. What happened? What, what just, who rubbed everything off so quickly? Urbanization. Um, leaning more to the Western way of life. I mean, our education system is Western, first of all. Mm. And it was seen as you are progressing, moving away from the things that were done in the villages. When you moved into the towns, and the cities. I honestly think there's still a place for those things. What, what are you doing as consultants and people in your field to, to revive that, to re, I don't know whether we can re-inculcate it in our teachers. I mean, when we talk about um, doing games workshops with the teachers, I go, I tell them, you find a tree with shade, you show the kids how to, you know, make the holes for Moraba Raba go and collect um, the stones. stones that they need, teach them how to play the game. Mm. And, you know, they've never thought about it, but when I tell them and I introduce it, they're like, ah, actually, you're right. It makes sense. Mm. You know, when we did it um, at one of our holiday schools, it was lovely. Some kids knew it. Yeah. Some Botswana kids knew it. Some Botswana kids didn't know it. And when other kids who are not Botswana tried to play it the first time, or you can see it's a skill. Mm. That hand and eye coordination is a skill. They couldn't do it. Mm. Even the Botswana kids who couldn't do it, who had never done it, couldn't do it. They needed to practice. Mm. But when we were young, it was nothing. It was effortless. Yes, it was effortless. Mm. But, but, but is there a change? Are they beginning to re-embrace it, to, to re-accept Marabaraba, for instance? At schools? Yeah, the ones that you're working with. Yes, they embrace it. They embrace it. The kids love it. Mm. 
and the change is upon us. It's happening. Yes, the change is upon us. Okay. Um, forest living schools, what is that? So forest schools um, started in Europe. Mm -hmm. It's outdoor learning. So they have this model of education in Europe called forest or nature schools. Mm -hmm. I had the privilege in 2019 to attend a conference in Zurich, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. This conference was held in the forest where the children go to school. So you drop your kids off, there's a meeting point in the forest, and you spend, the kids spend the whole day in the forest, playing and learning, climbing trees, picking up rocks and sticks. It's Things we used to take for granted. Exactly. Up. You know, when I first heard of that, I thought... Looking for moretto, the moretto yes, loja, these are wild yes. fruits. Yeah. Now the kids don't even know those. Mm. You know, I thought when I heard of forest schools that Western education came to Botswana and told us, no, don't run around with your, sh you need shoes on, you need, kids need to be dressed like this in a classroom to Cause, learn. Yeah. And now they are so far ahead of us as far as, you know, their education system goes and they got to a certain point and they realized that actually, this is no, mm. let's drop all of this and let's go outside and mm. let's let the kids Develop. Learn, yes, develop naturally. Because I mentioned that I'm a farm boy. I grew up in Makatanyane and Mahumalebi. Those are cattle posts. And some of the things that are, are making a difference in my mm. life come from those formative years. What we used to do, yeah, like I told you, you know, actually organizing our own food physically yes. out there in the bush. Yes. It was, it was great fun. I envy that life. Yeah, hunting for muta, finding mm. muta. And, and those sort of uh, things. Yes. So how can that be applied in Botswana? The government would have to recognize it mm. and adopt it, or even private schools. Even private schools. And when I open a school, it's why, why definitely... Do, why do you need government's permission if you own the school? No, I'm saying for the majority, because the majority of kids go to government school. Mm. The government would have to adopt it. But private schools, of course, it's just to know about it and to adopt it. When I open a school, it's definitely going to be based on outdoor learning. We talk of camping, isn't it? Yes. Is it something similar? Because um, in America they would have a summer camp. Ah, yes. Mm. Similar. Yes, mm. quite similar because those kids have, you know, projects that they do and they're mostly outside. Yes, similar. But imagine this is every day, mm. Monday to Friday. And you know, the kids who go... In other words, you split the time between the classroom and the forest. There are different models. Mm. There are schools that are strictly outdoors. And then there are schools that have a portion in the classroom mm. or they there are schools that are in the classroom and then they introduce being outdoors. Mm. So it's definitely doable at different levels okay. for schools. All right. I think you need to open your own school and, and we use it as, a, as an example. It's definitely in the plans. Yeah, I think that would be great. Um, the one question that I like my asking my guests is, where do you see your company and your business five to ten years from now if you had to grab the crystal ball and look forward? We'll definitely have opened our first school. Mm -hmm. We'll continue consulting and growing the consultancy to help other schools. Um, yeah. Ten years from now? Uh, ten years from now, we'll still be in education. But for me, education is not just in the classroom or school-based. This for me is education. Mm. Like I said, my purpose is to share information. I love the stories of people's lives. Mm -hmm. We're going, we want to publish children's books. We want a platform where we talk to everyday people about their purpose, the meaning of their lives, their experiences. Okay, have you thought of writing a book? I've definitely thought of writing a yeah, book. You're about to start. Not at the moment. Mm. It's definitely in my mind. The time will come. Mm. The time will come. Okay. Okay. So the time will come when you'll have a book. Yes. Uh, okay. That's exciting. This is a part of the show when, where you get to ask me a question. Mm. Shoot. 
where do you see yourself in 10 years? Okay, so you're asking me the same question mm. that I asked you. Um, I want to see us um, having a, a sizable portfolio, possibly 2,000 units. I want to see our mentorship program mm. well established, ongoing. I want to see um, an army of entrepreneurs that mm. has been created by what we do. We want to continue running the businesses that we're running. I mean, we're in law, we're in hospitality, we're in restaurants, and we're in several other areas. We like to, to live, uh, to, to create a sustainable mm. uh, legacy type business. Um, so in 10 years, we want a fair amount of recognition. We want to have developed uh, the rest of our plot here in the CBD. Mm. We have huge monstrous dreams, monstrous dreams. I mean, large dreams, visions, huge visions, to the extent that we take the view that we're just getting started. I love this platform, Rabu mm. Hobe. Mm. When I saw it, I don't know much about you. I knew the building. Mm -hmm. And like I said, you're my neighbor. Uh -huh. Right opposite me. Yes. So I knew Ramu Hobe lives opposite me. Okay, he's got this building. And when I saw on Facebook the podcast, mm. I was like, Ramu Hobe is living his dream. <laughs> <laughs> living his dream. Of course, I want the podcast in 10 years to be at least 20 million subscribers. Get me and on as a co-host. Yeah, I, I want it to grow and I want it to, to be self-sustaining. I think at that point, my plan is that when it's already really, really established, like after five years, mm. I can then start bringing people in because I'm still laying the foundation. Mm. I, I have a vision of me spending five years just laying the foundation. Mm. So you now you found out my secrets. You're doing wonderful <laughs> work. Yeah. I love especially the fact that you are teaching. Mm. And you, you don't want to be the only one with certain skills. You want to impart no, those don't. skills onto the young. I love that there are young people working for you. It's wonderful. Wonderful. It's a privilege. It's an honor. Um, this is the time of the show when you look at that camera there um, and you share something inspirational, something motivational that will leave the individual watching uplifted and encouraged. We all have a purpose. We all have a voice inside of us that tells us, go this way. Many of us don't listen to it, we ignore it, but that's the voice that leads you to your purpose. So listen to it, and I think life will be joyful. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, do you mind sharing your contact details with the viewer? I'm on Facebook as Tebuho Ubuseng. I'm also on LinkedIn as Tebuho Ubuseng. You can contact me on my phone number 756 54759. Thank you very much. You've been a great guest. Vast depths of knowledge. I recognize you, I acknowledge you. You're a wonderful neighbor. We may be neighbors we haven't met until now. <laughs> yes. You know, in this life we live. I mean, you've been my neighbor, what, two, three years? Yes. But it's only recently that we that got we to met. meet. It's, uh, it's very interesting. So you've done very, very well. I, I really appreciate you, madam. Thank you so much for having me, Ramahovi. Okay.